Excuse the jitters of the presentations. There seems to be some uh, graphical issue, but I guess we'll have to live with it. So I thought I would uh, tell you a bit about uh, what is going on in the world of cellular IoT these days. Um, surprisingly, uh, it's come to my attention that some people in the world have not yet find out, found out that they need to be rather excited about cellular IoT. Uh, <laughs> and this is uh, quite seriously though. I think it has the potential to change sort of the, the entire landscape of devices that we have uh, surrounding us. So. I mean, most of the things you have today that are, are so-called so smart are really connected through something else, right? You have your smartwatch connected to your smartphone, and you have your pulse belt connected to your pulse watch, and you have your Hue lights connected to your Hue gateway and then wired into your home internet, for example. Uh, but uh, what if we could create those kinds of devices connecting directly to a global infrastructure that is uh, just there and available, and you can connect to it straight away. So we're here to talk about, or I'm here to talk about, the opportunities to do this for companies uh, or individuals who make IoT products. And I hope by the end of this talk you will have sort of the basic primer to explain to uh, all the rest of the people who are not here uh, how and why they should be excited about this also. Um, I just want a, a short uh, sort of show of hands. Who of you would sort of self-identify uh, as a software person, just sort of curious in, in IoT? Not really that hands-on kind of person. And who's a hobbyist electronics person playing around with an Arduino or a Raspberry Pi or something? Yes. And who would identify as a full-on hardware guy? Like hardware is what you do for a living. OK, thank you, thank you. Um, so in the world of, of uh, cellular IoT, or mobile IoT, as we call it, um, this is the term you'll probably come across if you start doing some research. And uh, this stands basically for mobile IoT. It's a term that's been cho chosen by the telco companies to, to gather uh, all of these different technologies that I will mention. Um, so that, that's something you might come across, just, uh, just so you know. And mobile IoT, or MIoT, is also, of course, the topic then of this talk. I thought I would mention three aspects of mobile IoT. We'll go into, obviously, the networks. We have two new networks that have been added into the 4G standard that you could uh, start developing products for and play around with. I'll mention a bit uh, about the, the sort of anatomy and the terms and the naming of, of the hardware that's involved, so that if you decide to go into the space, uh, you could uh, know what's what and, and sort of how to talk to your hardware guy. And then finally, also, I'll show you a few different uh, dev kits and evaluation boards and get into some examples of, of uh, how the hardware actually works. Um, before we go there, uh, I just want to sort of set the stage. So I work at Telia, obviously, and uh, this picture I usually show. Uh, in Telia, I work in the part on the right, which is called Division X. And we're sort of the innovation, do all the new cool stuff department. And we're trying to sort of uh, bring some old life into the, the dragon there on the left. Uh, just to, uh, and of course, one of the major focuses in, in uh, coming up with these new products and services and so on is, is Internet of Things. And just to give one example of one thing we have done in the past, when we started here in Norway about three years ago, um, one of the major contributions early on was removing cloud from the list of curse words in the Telia technology department. So, so uh, quite honestly, uh, back then, so of course here in Norway, together with the technology department, um, yeah, it, you were not allowed to run anything in the cloud, basically. And obviously, it's way easier to, in our web shop, outscale an iPhone launch uh, on AWS than it is with on-prem. So that's so, sort of something that we've uh, been contributing to, to putting things into a state where, where probably they rather belong, to be honest. Um, but by challenging the status quo and, uh, and doing some new stuff, uh, at least new for, for us at that time point. Uh, so one more um, point on like why do we have a Division X and what do we want to accomplish? accomplish? Um, the idea here is, is basically to make the Telia connectivity your preferred connectivity if you're making one of these devices. So uh, in the space of mobile IoT, why, why should you choose Telia? Or in the space of connectivity-related products uh, and services anywhere, why would you choose the Telia connectivity? Um, and the reason we're thinking about this is obviously the most uh, common 
concept that you care about in the telco world currently is how much data do I have? Calls are free, SMS is included, and, and most of your um, worry is about do I have enough gigabytes left? No matter if you're sort of a customer uh, directly to tell you or if you're, if you're a business customer, this is like the number one thing. And the, the only thing we can compete on when it's about data is basically pricing. And pricing, it's, uh, it's nice to have a good price, but it's kind of boring for us as a company. And the other thing we might use to um, compete, of course, is our network. But then again, we have two of the best networks probably in the world in Norway. And we might win one test and the blue propeller guys might win the next. But it's really like two of the very best networks on the very most uh, modern infrastructure in, in, in 4G that we have today. So really, OK, we can, like I said, win one and lose the next. But we can't like dominate. We can't use that as an argument to go with the teleconnectivity. And uh, that's fine. That's the way the market is here. So we want to think about other things we might add surrounding our connectivity to make it easier for anyone who's making a connectivity-related product to uh, get started and do what they want to achieve in, in their company. So we have uh, very openly de described that we are not going to be a connectivity provider anymore. We are on a journey from just connectivity provider to being a technology company. And that means uh, providing of course, the connectivity, and that should be the best uh, sort of uh, connectivity ever, and uh, we'll always keep, keep that, of course. But we want to add other components on the side and form this sort of platform where, where you can integrate with us and, of course, pick and choose whatever you need for your project, but it should be the easiest way forward, um, at least we think so. And on the top of this, we're also working actively to build up uh, what we call the partner ecosystem or the partner network, so that if you have a need, if you're a software company and you need a hardware company or vice versa, uh, that should be really straightforward too. So I'm not going to uh, belabor this anymore. Uh, this is what I do in the part of this. I am the hardware guy. Um, this product here on the right is one of these partners I mentioned in the partner network. They had a problem with intermittent connection in the early days of one of these networks I will be explaining shortly. And so they sent us one of these faulty devices. And I tried to, meanwhile, uh, as they were debugging in their office over in Stavanger, I was doing my part, uh, looking at their firmware, trying to make some changes, talking to our network guys and comparing the logs that they were seeing and trying to figure out, since this were uh, the very early days, uh, was there something wrong with the network, something wrong with the module, something wrong with the firmware? Uh, stuff like that. So, so this exemplifies how hands-on we're trying to be when it comes to, to mobile IoT. So, okay, sorry about the uh, uh, company presentation. But now, let's talk about the actual networks. So, you want to create an Internet of Things application. In your personal space, as you know, you have like the very common options of Bluetooth or Ant, like I said again, for your smartwatch to connect to your smartphone, your pulse belt with Ant Plus to your sports watch, for example. Going a little bit further in your home or office space, you have the Wi-Fi and the Zigbee that the Hue Lights is using. Um, if you go even further, say a city-wide or country-wide network, and you have some sort of application in mind, you could go to something like uh, LoRa or Sigfox, this uh, LP1 technologies, low power wide area networks. And this is um, sort of the same space that we're talking about. But if you want to do a LoRa network, one option would be if there is no network already available, there are some operators, like some certain cities have implemented their own LoRa networks. Some companies are off offering some sort of, uh, of a nationwide uh, networks in some places, but it's kind of uh, spotty at the moment on the map. Um, if you don't have an operator, then you will need to become your own operator, meaning you will have to put up a base station or a LoRa gateway, for example, to cover whatever area that you need. Um, and so part of the argument for going with a mobile standard is for all of you who don't feel like becoming an operator. You want to just have the connectivity and be done with it. So then the two new things we're adding to the 4G picture is LTM and narrowband IoT. Those are brand new, or well, in 2016 they were brand new, but they're additions to the 4G standard. So very much a standardized protocol that will be uh, sort of rolled out in, in most 4G networks, uh, nation, uh, or countrywide, um, worldwide even. Um, 
So yes, that's uh, very much something you could consider for the, that broader um, range if it's city-wide, country-wide, or worldwide even. So like I, uh, I said, this is 4G. We're using the same 4G network. We've done some uh, upgrades and tweaks to the some of the base stations, but it's uh, sort of native in the same network as uh, we had before. So there's no nothing new really there. Uh, what's new is the actual protocols themselves. And like I said, they were added into the 4G standard in 2016. And um, just to say something about the motivation, why do we need IoT protocols in the 4G standard besides it's like cool and stuff? Um, and one of the reasons for that is, of course, that 5G is coming. So next year, 5G will probably be standardized. Uh, and the uh, end of next year, or maybe early 2020, we'll see the first uh, devices actually in the market. But so that means we as a telco, and most telcos, frankly, they are still running three generations uh, of telco technology in our technology stacks. So we have 2G, 3G, and 4G, and now we want to add 5G as well. I mean, that's a lot of generations of technology to be running at one time. <clears throat> and I mean, that's one thing. And then we also need frequency spectrum to actually deploy these different standards in. And uh, those are not cheap to come by. Um, there aren't that many available even. So 3G, that's fairly simple. Most phones that were using 3G are sort of retired a long time ago. And most new phones, uh, all new phones basically, have 4G already. So that one's pretty simple. The base stations that are on 3G, we can sort of upgrade them and then just stop doing 3G. That's easy. But the issue is what's called the old machine-to-machine -machine devices, right? So the 2G devices, the things that you have in maybe your home alarm system that calls your security company if someone breaks into your house. That's probably 2G. The thing that's in every taxi for the dispatch to send out new sort of uh, driving assignments to the taxi drivers, most of that is 2G. Um, the thing you have in your cabin so that you can send a text message on Friday so it's warm when you get there in the evening, most likely that's also on 2G. And the reason for that is there's basically been zero incentive to move over to a more modern standard because if all you need is a text message or like a tiny bit of data, 2G has been and still is the absolutely by far most inexpensive option uh, for the hardware that is. The, mod the modem or the module that you need to do 2G is it's really commonplace. You can get it for nothing. So obviously, if we as a telco are going to sort of convince you to move over to modern technology, we need to have a modern alternative that's not uh, four times as expensive just for the hardware. And that's where LTEM and Airband IoT comes in. So this is uh, the first time that instead of uh, adding maximum, increasing the maximum throughput and adding more barriers and more fancy stuff so that you can stream YouTube from the comfort of your own toilet, uh, the first time ever since the uh, uh, since, uh, starting of, of the, the telco era, we've done the opposite. We've reduced the complexity, taken away features, and simplified what we have in the 4G um, standards and gone and made it IoT specific. So you get lower speeds and you get uh, lower power consumption as a return for that. And of course, the, with a lower complexity also comes lower cost for these modules. <clears throat> so, yes. Again, your incentive to move off 2G and because it's way lower power and more efficient than 2G also, this is the enabler that will um, make it possible to create these new kinds of devices that I at least think might be coming for sure. So let's start talking about Narband IoT. This is the biggest news. This is as far as we've been from uh, what was available before in the telco world. This is 20 kilobits per second. Seriously, that's slower than the dial-up you had in 1996. It's really slow, but it's so slow that it's also using a very small amount of power as long as you send very little data. And because of that, they've been able to take away so much, like I said, 
uh, so that the modules also are projected to become way cheaper than 2G modules once they begin to ship in bigger quantities. There are some constraints, obviously. Trade-offs uh, are likely in this scenario. You have, in most modules that are available today, only UDP, so no TCP uh, capability, meaning you'll have to do some more legwork. There's no voice. Obviously, 20K is kind of way too slow to, to transfer sound. There is text message specified in the standard, but we haven't um, sort of implemented that in our network, and I don't know a lot of telcos that have, to be honest. Um, but that's something that could be coming in the future. <clears throat> So LTM, it's faster than 2G, but still has the same benefits, not as extreme as narrowband IoT, but you're still getting lower power consumption. And once we hit, again, volume uh, for the modules, they will be cheaper than the 2G modules are currently, because they're less complex. And uh, yes, the speed, there's different uh, sort of variants, but in the simplest form, the max throughput is uh, 300k. If you have what's called a multi-tone module, you could get one megabit. But uh, yeah, 300k, one megabit, somewhere in that region is the maximum. Full feature set, like I said, from 2G, you get uh, TCP, UDP, whatever you need, uh, voice and text messages, that's done working, no problem. So this really, if you're making something on 2G or 3G today, this is your incentive. This is what you need to be looking into if you want something that's better than those and if you want to be future-proof. LTM uh, and you need sort of the throughput of, uh, of 2G uh, today, this is what you need to look into. Yes, so the narrowband IoT, that's more of a low power wide area network contender, so an alternative, um, sort of managed alternative, if you will, to Sigfox or LoRa. There we have several, several pilot projects ongoing since, uh, yeah, like I said, we started with this in 2016. So uh, some of them are nearing uh, sort of commercial launches, and uh, I'm sure you will hear about those when they happen. LTEM, there the deployment is a bit uh, slower, uh, but it's also ongoing. For narrowband IoT, we probably, hopefully, uh, will be nationwide by the end of this year. And uh, LTEM, I'm not so sure. But uh, yeah, and like I mentioned, the LTEM, that's more of a replacement for your GPRS needs uh, as they are today. Yes. So those are the two networks. Now, moving on to an anatomy lesson. Since we're all tech people here, I guess we can all agree that inside our devices uh, are a bunch of transistors. I won't uh, go any deeper into that. All of those transistors live on a die made from silicon. And that die of silicon, uh, of silicon with all the billions and billions of transistors go into a chip with some electrical connections so that you can hook this up to whatever you need. So now. There are many different kinds of chips, obviously. Uh, and some companies make it their speciality to take a few chips, let's say a microprocessor, a radio, and maybe some sort of amplifier, and make a radio module. Let's say they implement the narrowband IoT stack in the microprocessor, they tune the radio just right, and they use all of their know-how and their engineering effort into making it the perfect module so that you could easily take, uh, take that and put it down uh, in a product without redoing all of that engineering effort. So that's what you would call a module. So there could be a connectivity module or, or other types of modules. So that's the difference between a chip and a module. And then if you want to use this module, you need some sort of circuit board. You'll make a often green printed circuit board or PCB for short. And you'll add, need some other things like maybe an antenna on the left there, uh, a processor to tell the connectivity module what to do, a SIM card in the middle there, and, and perhaps some sensor for your sensing application. And uh, yeah, this would be your board. And then if you're going to sell this, it's kind of uh, pointy. You need a nice enclosure for this. So, we're going to put this in a box, and if it's battery powered, you need somewhere to store your battery as well. So we're going to put the battery in there as well. And this 
in my world is what you might call a device or at least a product. A device is scary because people tend to call everything a device. So beware of that if you're talking to, to uh, people in the hardware space. But at least product, I guess, would be a good name for this. Or thing. Yes. So an example of this might be this board from Dutch company Sodak. Here you have a couple of modules. You have a connectivity module from Ubox, which is a big module provider. You have a GPS module on the right there, also from Ubox. And you have a bunch of connectors for extra sensors. You have a connector for the SIM card, USB for programming the thing. And then you have a couple of chips also on the board. So you need the microcontroller there to actually talk to the connectivity module. You need the sensor, which in this case is an accelerometer, and the GPS, of course, is also a sensor in a sense. Um, yes, so that's one way uh, how it might look in the real world. And if you wanted to sort of make this into a product, of course, this is what I might call a development kit. It's not really a finished product that they would send to an end user. But if you wanted to make sort of five or ten out of something, you could go and buy an enclosure and put this in, and stick a battery in there, do some programming and, and be done with it. But most likely where this would fit is you buy this for your firmware developer while you go tell your uh, hardware developer to make your custom board exactly to the specs you need. Um, I want to say some more things about the anatomy of the module itself, uh, especially in the connectivity space, you have basically three options, or more like two options. The one on the right is what I described earlier. You have a separate microcontroller for processing. That's where your application lives. And then you have a separate connectivity module there on the top. That's what's doing all the connectivity. And that has some benefits and some, uh, some sort of downsides. It's more flexible if you want to have exactly your processor that you're used to, used, that you're used to from before. And you want to maybe be able to change out what connectivity you're using. You want to start with a sort of legacy 2G or 3G solution and move over to something more modern as time goes along, stuff like that. More flexibility. Or if you have already an existing product and you just want to add in sort of connectivity, then, of course, you may already have your, your processor decided for you. So, so you can just add in a connectivity module. Um, I guess the biggest downside is the size. This then needs more room on your PCB. So if you have size constraints, this might, might not be the optimum choice. The next step then, and the second most common, is to actually have an application processor integrated into the module. And we don't see as many of these yet, but I think they will be more, more common as time goes by. Um, but that's basically, well, as you, as you can see, it's slightly more compact, but um, it also brings some constraints. So what if you don't really need all of that processing power that that processor supplies? Maybe you could have gone with a separate connectivity module and a way smaller microcontroller, or even worse, vice versa. What if, this power, uh, what if this microcontroller that's integrated is not powerful enough? Then you might need to add even yet another component, and your total cost will go way up. So a lot of considerations here. If you're fine with the constraints, you get probably a more integrated solution that's easier to work with, and more sort of code examples from, from the vendor and so on. Um, and you get a more compact solution, but um, it depends. And the third option. Yeah, this really only applies if you're like Apple or Samsung or someone. If you go no module, you're like talking directly to Huawei, buying their chipset for narrowband IoT and integrating it uh, into your own product. That's like if you're making an Apple Watch or a phone. If you're expecting huge volume, like seriously huge volume, this by far the most sort of compact and small way you could do it most flexible because you could choose all the components uh, as you wish, but it's really complex, like seriously complex. You need to do certification and, and all kinds of fancy stuff and the RF uh, voodoo. Um, that's really 99.9% .9 of the cases you're looking at module with or without integrated MCU. 
Yes. So that was the module anatomy and the device anatomy. We're moving on swiftly to the third part, the hardware. That's what we've been waiting for. Uh, the concrete things I want to show you are, well, some evaluation kits and development boards that I've been talking about uh, as terms. Uh, what are those really? So an evaluation board, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's a board that you buy to evaluate a product. Typically, you buy an evaluation board from a module vendor because you're evaluating their product. If I were to differentiate between the terms, a development kit you might buy from someone like Sodak. It might have more features, uh, such as uh, sensors already added in so that you could build a prototype directly. But I mean, those terms are used pretty much interchangeably. So I was thinking I'll use these three companies ex as examples. Ublox, you already heard about. Pycom is another cool. Uh, sort of uh, IoT up-and-coming company, and Nordic, as you might know, can't go without mentioning Nordic, always, uh, obviously, uh, since they're a Norwegian company. Um, yes, so these are the dev kits. We'll start with the Ublox one. This is really what you get from a big module vendor like Ublox. They bring in this board, it's about this size. It actually, it's so big, I didn't even bring it. It comes in a briefcase this size. I'm not joking. Uh, so it's really impressive when you get it in the mail and you go <laughs> But what you get in the board, so, so yes, you see you have some pin connections uh, on both sides of the module. So you have all the pins exposed. You have a USB uh, interface to talk directly to the chip. And you even have a place there to put the GP, uh, GPS module because Ublox Ublox also make GPS modules uh, down at the left. Um, you get the COM port for your COM port cable, if that's your thing. Um, but the thing with this is it's so big and it's so many parts. You even get a separate power supply with it, so it's not really convenient to sort of uh, throw in your bag and bring with you. So actually, I didn't even bother. I brought one of these uh, Sodak uh, boards. This is not the exact one that you saw previously, but this is an Arduino Shield variant of that very same board. So this goes on top of a uh, typical Arduino. <clears throat> um, next up, the Pycom. This is interesting. So it has tons of connectivity options. The there are two basic versions that have uh, cellular support. The GPI, which has Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, narrowband, and LTM. And then there's the FiPi, which is on the picture here, which also, in addition to that, has Sigfox and LoRa. That's a lot of connectivity. So uh, the form factor of this one also, this is way more integrated and ready to go, right? The way they've made this board, the tiny one that you see in the middle of, uh, of the PyCon board there, it's so small that you might even, for a small production run, you could just integrate this as it is. You do your development on this baseboard here, make your own development, uh, your own baseboard rather, with the sensors you need, and just buy 10 or 15 or 50, maybe even 100 of those, and just use those as, as they are. Or, of course, if that's more your thing, you could integrate, buy the module from them after you've done your development, and just integrate uh, the actual module on your own board. Up to you. And then Nordic, uh, Nordic is uh, sort of uh, not commercially available yet, so um, I can't really tell you a huge amount. But what's really cool about this Norwegian product, uh, well, it was uh, developed in Finland, by the way, but Nordic Semiconductor is Norwegian. The NRF91 is seriously the smallest package I've seen. It has the integrated processor, as I mentioned before, uh, but still, it's almost half the size of that Ublox module over there. So it's seriously impressive what they managed to put into that uh, little beast over there. OK, so let's start with the Ublox. So this one, since it does not have an integrated processor, you're required to send something as fancy as AT commands. And uh, if you were alive in the 80s, I barely was. You might know, or know all about this already. Um, but that's still the sort of, that's what we get. Even in a sort of high-end uh, 4G device, 
Yes, you're sending text and uh, parsing strings. So on the developer kit uh, I've shown on the picture here, all you get is a USB uh, interface directly to the ship to send these AT commands so that you can try out the command set. Uh, or alternative, of course, if you have a prototype hardware already of your own, or like a Raspberry Pi or, or an Arduino, you could hook up to the pins with the UART and uh, sort of start making your application. <clears throat> but it's going to be sort of a big, bulky prototype. <clears throat> Um, so one good thing about uh, Ublox is they've been making modules for a long time and they have a whole family in the same form factor. So if you have one that's using Ublox SARA module already on 3G or 2G or something, most likely you can just drop in a narrowband IoT product, for example, if you want to try it out in, in your existing hardware design. Um, and there's also, since they were really early uh, in the game with Nerband IoT, they were one of the companies who made sort of the first reference products. Uh, since they've been around for, for almost the longest, they, there are a lot of kits like the Sodak kit and others available in the market as alternatives to their own official evaluation boards. So I just thought I'd show you how it works, if I can. Let's see if there's Nerband coverage here. That will be exciting. So I'm just going to go here. And of course, so this is like the first thing you would test if you get one of these. Can you see this? Yes. So I'm just going to write, AT, OK, hello. Let's see, maybe am I connected to the network? Oh yeah, zero 05, all is well. We are actually roaming. Five means roaming, you remember that? Um, yes, because I'm using a foreign SIM card in this one for, for uh, secret reasons. Um, yeah, so what, let's, what do you want to do? Let's uh, send something somewhere. Okay, we're going to need a socket to send data. So that's so cr socket create. Of course, I want to create a datagram socket because I read the documentation. And since we're on Narband IoT here, we are only supporting UDP, so I have to choose UDP 17, obviously. And the port, let's use port 123. And uh, one, I can't even remember what that means. OK, so we got a socket, socket number zero. Now let's send data. Where do you want to send data to? Let's send source. I don't even know what that means. So I'm using socket zero. I'm going to send it to Ublox Echo server, echo.ublox.com. Uh, I'll do an automatic DNS uh, call in my head and give you the IP straight away. That's the IP. And they want port 7. And let's send three bytes of data. What do you think we should send? I think ABC is easy enough. So I would love to, of course, type that in, but that wouldn't work. That would be way too easy. So we're going to need the ASCII code for A in hex. Anyone? 41. Yes, that's amazing. <laughs> it's actually 41. Yeah, 41, 42, 43. That's the ASCII code for ABC. And so I'm sort of uh, giving them a hard time. But of course, that's so you can send new lines and quotes and stuff. So it's kind of makes sense, but it's really complex to write. And I made a mistake. How can that be? Mm -mm. Oh, I made, yes, of course. Silly me. That's, it's the cheese command. Uh, let's cheat a bit. Yes, okay, socket zero sent three bytes. And look, we got something back. And Sumai is telling us we got on socket zero three bytes. I wonder what they might be. So ARF of obviously in SARF is for receive. It has R in it. Socket zero, please receive me three bytes. And look, there it is. So we just did narrowband. How amazing is that? 
<clears throat> so, <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. So, so this, if you're a developer and you were supposed to write the code that did that, you might get pretty annoyed pretty quickly, potentially. <clears throat> so you have some options there since uh, this is uh, um, where you could choose your own separate processor. You could go with the one that you know from before and where you uh, sort of know for sure you hate the string parsing features or whatever. Um, uh, and you could go with the IDE that you're used to and there's really some benefits to that when you're actually doing the development. Um, but yeah, it's a chore and, and there's not really a lot in terms of libraries available that do this for you. Like Sodak makes some, for example, but they might not be perfect for your application, so you might have to tweak them. And yeah, you'll, you'll be spending a lot of time parsing strings simply and making state machines. So that's the good and the, and the bad. <clears throat> Moving on then to the PyCom. This one is really cool. And it might seem way more compelling, at least to a software person. It has a lot of connectivity options, like I mentioned. So if you need those, it's awesome. Uh, it has a processor included inside the module, so you don't need to choose a separate one. And it runs on that processor, straight from PyCom, a Python interpreter that runs MicroPython. So that's a subset of Python 3 that lets you write Python on the embedded hardware. And if there's some die-hard hardware people, uh, there's one somewhere over there. Yeah, I see he doesn't feel well right now when I've said the word Python and embedded in the same sentence. It's really, I mean, <laughs> I'm not going to judge, but if, if you're a hardware person, this is probably not something you'll like. If you're a software person, however, you probably might l even love this because it's sort of uh, accessible. It gives you something that you can relate to, like an API or, or a library, rather, to, to um, talk to the device. Uh, but if you run into problems and the hardware guy starts talking about hardware debuggers and breakpoints, you don't even have the original firmware from PyCom to, to do that. So. Uh, it's some benefits again and, and some downsides that you have to work with. And uh, like I said, we have library access to the modem. So let's go and look what that might feel like in our software over here. Yes. Hello. So I am in. A Python interpreter. Oh, what am I doing? Look, we could probably want to do the LTE example. So let's import network. And uh, can even do tab completion, like over serial port. That's insane. I have an LTE object now, and let's just, uh, I guess, go ahead and uh, connect. Oh, no, we got an exception, of course. Sorry, we need to attach first. So that's good. It's thro throwing even an exception, showing us that we did something wrong. So LTE attach. Yes, so let's see if that worked. Ah. Uh -huh. Nope. Still not. Let's try that again. Mm. So unfortunately, this is where we get to the last point, if you read ahead in the presentation. So unfortunately, so I, I choose this for a reason. Unfortunately, the PyCom people have, for some reason, not been able to make their library implementation work with the specific Telia Norway network yet. And I am personally working with them to make it happen. I, I don't want to give them a bad rep here or anything. Just to point out, if you're in the market for a dev kit, it might not even work. So, so I mean, this is one of the things that we found find out pretty quickly. It's sort of the first person with the Telia SIM card tried to put it in this, tell, told us it doesn't work. And we're on the case. Seriously, I like Pycom. It seems like an awesome product, and I want to sort of try it out more. But we need to find whatever it is. It's probably just some obscure thing inside their firmware. 
but but you as a user you're really out of luck until we figure it out so just be aware of that when you're choosing your dev kit this one like i said it may look really compelling uh, but just make sure just check with us first all right um yes that's pycom Finally, like I said, can't go without mentioning Nordic Semiconductor. They have this really cool device, which is coming out in uh, sort of mass production end of the year, I think October-ish or something. Um, so the NRF is very much still in development, therefore I'm not sure what the final APIs or, or uh, libraries will look like. I just made some generic C example here. But at least you're writing in sort of native on the chip, on the module C, uh, or I guess it supports C++ as well, I'm assuming. Um, but again, you have the smallest module that's been announced in the market. You have the integrated processor still, so it's all both smaller and uh, uh, sort of has this added feature. And um, yeah, the dev kit I have, Oh, I forgot to bring it, but um, it actually has uh, some connection, uh, connection points for sensors and it's compatible with Arduino shields, even if it's not uh, the very same form factor like this one, but uh, it has the, the right pin spacing for it. So you might reuse uh, existing uh, hardware there. And uh, yeah, I'm not going to spoil too much basically about Nordic, I just want to mention them because uh, my good friend Peter from uh, Nordic is actually having his own talk on Friday. Uh, right here at 4.20, so I think it will be worth sticking around for if you're interested at all, uh, even if it's sort of uh, late on a Friday, but um, for that reason I'm not going to go very much more into detail of that right now, but just beware there is like local hardware available uh, very soon as well. Yes, so those were the three two and a half-ish dev kits. I'm going to move on to small sort of uh, sum up of what we've spoken about. So I told you about these new networks, LTM and narrowband IoT, that are going to enable you to, well, create new types of devices or upgrade existing ones at least to the latest telco standards. We've seen the chip, uh, the difference between a chip and the module, some anatomy, different types of modules and so on. We've spoken about uh, evaluation boards and development kits and uh, how they might differ in functionality and uh, that uh, you can't really be sure that they work at this point. Uh, warning there. And uh, to round off, I just want to go back to this picture. Um, so now you know the difference uh, between LTM and narrowband IoT. You know the terminology so that when you t talk to your hardware guy, he doesn't feel like he's doing IT support for his mom. And uh, you bought this dev kit, and now what? Where do you actually send the data? How do you make a backend for this? That might be uh, something that's actually more, more relevant even to some of you. Um, the most basic scenario is something that we could do all along. It's like basic uh, generic telco. Just get the SIM card from the connectivity box, get on the internet and send data to your good old REST API, for example, or whatever you have from before. Uh, on LTEM, you have all the TCP and UDP and whatever you need, uh, it should just work. Mm, if you want some more security, we also have another basic telco feature, uh, which is called the private APN. So that means all the SIM cards that you have in your company, they're part of a sort of a secret uh, pool of access w which you control. And that APN, it may or may not be on the internet. Probably if you're doing, uh, going through the effort of setting up a private APN, you want it to not be on the internet. And instead you will set up probably a VPN to your own backend. So that might be your sort of corporate network or it might be your cloud uh, infrastructure somewhere. And that enables you to send data from devices to your backend as if they were on a virtual or on a private network. And this means in turn that if your application allows it, you could be more relaxed about encryption of the payload, etc. If you don't want to sort of belabor your tiny little uh, hardware device that's expected to have uh, 
10 years battery life with doing a really hard encryption, you might just say that the VPN tunnel is enough for, for some use cases. Uh, if you still want, uh, of course, the encryption, you, you, that's totally fine. You can do, do that through the VPN tunnel as well. You have sort of double layers of security. And that's that's a standard telco. That's been offered for years for, for this space. Uh, the new stuff on the left, I mentioned, uh, for example, data point as a service. That is basically an IoT service. So if you don't have a backend of your own already that you want to integrate to, we made one that we can reuse. Uh, so it's basically saving you some time, especially if you're using narrowband IoT and you haven't implemented a UDP endpoint with some protocol yet. We made one uh, for you that you can use. So you send your data in and you have a basic a typical REST API to just get it back out on the other end. So you might use that to integrate to your own backend without having to worry about the narrowband IoT special case. Um, or you could even you could implement your application, uh, like your uh, app or your website or whatever service it is, straight on top of this if you wanted to. So again, these different building blocks are something we want to provide to you if, if you see a good use for them. We're not, definitely not saying one size fits all. This is a sort of a smorgasbord. But uh, if you're using DataPoint as a service, sending your data in, you have some users. And yeah, you need to handle their data. So you're going to step on the GDPR line. And then if you haven't already got the solution for that, well, we made one. So you can store your consents from your users in Trust as a Service, and you can get their identity with the identity provider that we made. So this is all sort of tying together so that, for example, uh, we're working on the last data insights part. but. If you were to, exam for example, uh, um, deploy sensors and you don't add GPS or any other type of location feature inside the device itself, well, we can give you an approximate location of your sensor from the mobile network because we know what base station it's talking through, for example. So given that you have identity and the user has given consent, we might be able to use data insights to enrich the data point that you created with the location of the device if you use our connectivity. So that's sort of the way we try to uh, chain these things together and make it so that you would like to uh, use this because it makes stuff easier in the end. Yes. So those are some considerations uh, in terms of how you go about implementing uh, sort of your backend. Uh, you could do this or you could roll, roll, roll your own completely. It's uh, totally up to you. We want to offer this um, as a good sort of compelling option, that basically. Yes, those were the things I had. Uh, if you want to reach out, feel free to send an email or use the contact form at telia.no slash IoT. And um, that's it. Thank you. And I'll be happy to take any questions.